a few of you may have noticed that on the thumbnail for the first video in this little series there was a picture of the top yoke sitting on a grey block. The grey block is of course my nice big chunk of grade 6082 T6 aluminium. This is quite a big lump and clearly when we uh, overlay the yoke just on top to get a bit of a plan perspective we can see that a lot of that uh, block is going to end up in the swarf bin one way or another. I'll try and rescue some of it as I cut out the uh, very rough profile so it doesn't all go in the bin. Yeah. I've also been working on the CAD drawing for the design of the yoke. I've gone further than what I originally intended. It's more of a result of me sitting and thinking about how I want the yoke to eventually look and how I'm going to be able to machine it has really dictated that I can't just go in and cut three holes. I do need to give it a fair bit of thought to decide exactly how I want the lump to look before I really do apply cutters to it. So we can see here that the design has now evolved quite a bit from the rather crude drawing I showed previously. There's a lot more dimensions being shown on this and they have been corrected now to show actuals rather than the nominals that I had on the original drawing. You can also see that there is provision to mount the Motoscope Pro, the little LED device, on the yoke. In the spirit of being cautious, before I dive into this lump of aluminium on the milling machine, there are still a few more checks I want to carry out. I should note that this lump cost me, I think, about 85 quid all in uh, delivered which is not too bad but 85 quid I don't want to be throwing away later on in the process for some silly mistake up at the front. So the first check I'm going to be doing is for fit. So what I've done is I've printed off from the CAD package a one-to-one -one scale drawing of the yoke, stuck it onto a bit of stiff cardboard uh, and cut out the outline and as you can also see cut out the position for the forks and the stem. This semicircular part across the top is the digital display, the Motoscope Pro. I'll come back to that in a minute or two. With this template now cut out, I can actually try it for fit on the bike itself. The bottom yoke stem and forks are now back on the bike along with the tank. And what I'll do next is I'll actually try this for fit, sliding it over the stem and the forks, making sure that on the extremes of the steering lock, the rear edges of the yoke do not foul with the tank or with anything else. It's not going to be 100% accurate because of course there is a profile which which I don't have on this uh, cardboard cutout but it'll be good enough for me to have a level of confidence. We can see here the template has been fitted on the bike both the fork legs coming through and of course the steering stem as well. It looks okay, it's not 100% accurate because of course the template is only two dimensional. Uh, it doesn't incorporate the depth of the clamps that go further down the fork legs um, on both sides of course of the forks and of course it comes up higher on the clamp side. My area of concern was making sure the yoke didn't foul the tank and as we can see there is space there there's a gap of about five millimeters between the back edge of the yoke and the seam of the tank so we should be okay looking from the other side we can see hopefully quite clearly there's there's a gap at least five millimeters between the rear of the yoke and the seam of the tank and what we can also see here of course is the clamp section for the stem uh, and there's plenty of space between that and the seams of the tank, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that. In the first video I did make reference to the fact that I will be dispensing with the OEM clock console and instead I'll be using the Motoscope Pro. So this here is the Motoscope Pro, it's made by a company called Moto Gadget. It's as you can see it's very small, provision has been made in my design for the yoke for this to be accommodated. The milling machine I'm going to be using is a manual device. It's not a CNC. It's got no power feed on any of the axes. It's all going to be done manually via me winding the handles 
and using a, a digital readout which is mounted on the wall off screen. Before I actually get into starting to make any cuts for the actual yoke itself, I need to establish some reference points on the aluminium block. Um, what I've done here is again as I've taken a one-to-one -one printout of the outline of the yoke. I'll use this as a, as a bit of a template all the way through. All the dimensions I use when it comes to drilling holes, machining with end mills or slot drills are going to be determined from the reference point in the bottom left hand corner here. In fact that is why I've left that corner on this piece of paper as opposed to you see the right hand side where I've actually cut around the curve. So this is going to be my reference point all the way through and my CAD drawing has also now been set up so that all the various centre lines come from this point here. On the finished yoke, this front edge, um, which yeah, is the forward edge of the yoke on the bike, is needs to be flat and square. Um, of course the left and right corners are rounded as we go around those yoke clamps. For most of the operations I'm going to keep the extreme left hand corner here square to enable me to re-establish the reference point whenever I need to to make further cuts. Having established that the bottom left hand corner here is going to be my reference point, what I now need to do is mill and finish off the bottom surface and the left hand surface. To machine the block to get a surface finish on this bottom face I've got a choice of two approaches. Number one would be to secure the block standing vertically and then use an end mill or a fly cutter to finish off this face. The problem I have with that approach is I don't have any method of holding the block on the table that keeps this bottom surface, of course now the top, but keeps it free of any interference. Option two is to clamp the block flat on the table, or in fact with some parallel bars underneath to raise it slightly off the table and then use an end mill to run a cut along this face. The advantage of this approach is it allows me then to run a cut up the left hand face over here at the same time without moving the workpiece and therefore ensuring that I have a 90 degree or right angle between those two reference faces. The downside with this approach is the depth of the cut. It's a full 50 millimetres and my milling machine is not particularly rigid. Um, so a cut of that size may put a fair bit of stress on the overall machine and could lead to me encountering chatter as I try and machine this face. To counter that, of course, I am dealing with aluminium, which is quite soft. So I think I should be OK. Luckily, I do have an end mill which is big enough for this. So I've got a 50 mil depth of face here and we can see the length of this end mill is certainly longer than the depth of the cut. So we'll give it a go and see what finish we get. I will be taking very light cuts to avoid chatter. Fingers crossed we'll get away with it. I'm not going to take very much off this face. I just need a finish surface. So let's go on and give it a go. The block is now clamped firmly to the table. It's sat on a pair of parallel bars, um, which are actually down below or directly below the pinch point or the pressure point for the two clamps that are holding the block. So that is nice and secure, it won't be moving anywhere. I have also set it a little bit crudely by putting the dial gauge against the front here whilst traversing the table. So it is, it is fairly well aligned to the axis of the table, but it's actually quite an undulating finish when that block was cut. In terms of the mill, I've got the 18 millimeter diameter end mill in position. The milling head, the whole of this unit has been dropped quite a long way down. Um, and the remainder I'll just pick up with the quill to get the cutter to run the full length of the face. For the first cut, what we'll do is we'll run the table right the way across, uh, start at the mill and we'll find the edge by touching the cutter against the face here. And then we'll take a very light cut to full length, hopefully with no chatter. Uh, we'll have a look at the result and see where to go from there. 
The cutting speed for aluminium is quite high, so I've got the milling machine set up in the highest speed range, which is going to be around about 2150 RPM. Okay, we are just touching there. Let me reset the DRO for the Y axis. Which of course is off camera, so you can't see that. I've stopped it just to show where we've touched that off there and give an indication as to how uneven that surface is. So you can just see the cut mark there on the top quarter, top fifth of the block. So what we need to do is get this whole block flat. I'm going to put on a cut of 0.1 of a millimetre to start, nice and small. Lock the Y axis so it doesn't move. So, with 0.1 millimeter of a cut, we've not actually cleared the whole of that face, but we'll actually run that cut all the way across first and then we'll put on another 0.1 mil and see how we get on. When I was clocking across the face, uh, and it's quite rough there. I was getting a variation of over 0.2, so we're going to need at least three cuts, maybe four, uh, at 0.1 mil to get that flat. The last cut managed to get nearly all of that face cleaned up. There's a small little corner there which it hasn't managed to reach, but that's not a problem because that will be machined off later on anyway. To finish off, I now am going to face part of this left hand uh, edge. I'm not going to do all of it, I don't need to. I only need the bottom corner. Again, if we look at our little diagram, really all I need is, is a point down here to act as my reference. So anything above that, sorry, anything beyond that in terms of the y-axis doesn't matter. So again, as before, I'll just touch off on this, run a couple of cuts to get that nice and square, and then we'll be done. Both of the reference faces for the yoke have now been machined. We've got the front face here, and we've also got the part of the right-hand side. This is right-hand side from sat on the bike perspective, our left from the camera's perspective. As an aid going forward, what I've done is I've printed off again one-to-one -one scale the plan view of the yoke and I've stuck it onto the block. I won't actually be using this other than for a rough indication to make sure I'm not making any really stupid mistakes. All of the cuts I take with an end mill or with a slot drill will be taken from this reference corner, these two faces.